Sure. Recording is on. This is the Fellowship of the Link call for Wednesday, March 29th, 2023. Um, we are in our funny little Jitsi room. Uh, I, I think of Jitney every time I see Jitsi. So I think of this as having like a little like a little surrey with a fringe on top kind of thing in our, you know, as we bounce down the little country road in our conversations. I don't know why, but that that little image kind of flashes by when I see the Jitsi thing. Um, I, two things that I'd, I'd just like to sort of bring into the room because they might be useful and topical. Uh, Pete's aware of both of them because he's deeply enmeshed in both of them. Uh, one of them he caused. Uh, which which is last Thursday's OGM call. I the night before I sent out just a tongue in cheek. Too bad there's nothing to talk about. Kind of comment, you know, while inviting everybody to join the call, because there's way too much news in the world. And then Pete picked up and said, "Well, I've got an idea." And he said, "Let's make, let's put on a show. Uh, basically, let's let's write a volume, an edited volume book together, uh, which has morphed and turned into." Uh, kind of a takeover of the Monday morning since doing calls. Uh, and uh, Pete, correct me for all of this, like if I'm, if I'm framing it wrong, but uh, we're basically, uh, we need a new, a new name for this uh, project. Uh, Pete called it OGM Topics, which doesn't seem to me to have like the vital essence of, of what it might be, but it's, it's a nice uh, kind of way of creating an artifact that we can, that we can point to. Um, I layered onto it my neo book ideas, which are about creating several books that might share chapters. So uh, imagine several different edited volumes or books that, that have different narratives, but reuse some modules that are needed to explain different parts or even opinion modules or whatever else. Uh, and happy to go back to that. But there's a standing call now on Monday mornings at 1030. Uh, yes, the Monday mornings at 1030 Pacific. If, if you, uh, any of you want to join uh, that project uh, and we can sort of go back to it. And then the second thing is I had a really lovely conversation with Kyle Shannon, a very old friend of mine from New York days who back in 94, 95, when the web was but a, but a, but a little embryonic thing, uh, it created a, a, a group of webmasters called the World Wide Web Artists Consortium. And uh, they were meeting, and I, I, I met a bunch of my cool, young New York uh, f tech friends through uh, attending WAC meetings. And recently, he started playing with first Stable Diffusion because he's more of an artist and all that. But then when ChatGPT came out, this whole thing started going you know, nuclear. Nuclear, I think, in a good way. Going nuclear doesn't always sound like a good thing. Um, nuclear power. Exactly. So he created a new salon. Basically, uh, it's now called the AI Salon. It has calls that meet, I think, on Tuesdays, face-to-face uh, -face in Denver, if you happen to live in Denver, but you can join by Zooms. Uh, there's a meetup for it, which, which we can share the link to. Uh, but um, the so, so in my conversation with Kyle, uh, we got into, hey, how might we use ChatGPT in combination with my brain? So yesterday, uh, sorry, Monday during the Free Jerry's Brain Call, Kyle and a colleague of his, Cliff, basically joined the Free Jerry's Brain Call and we kicked around a bunch of ideas and got like a, a, a nice start, I think, on um, what we might do there. And I sent my latest brain archive over to Marc-Antoine Parent, who is the person who did an export back when into a Postgres uh, database. Uh, of my of my brain, so it, it'll be available, you know, uh, as JSON objects in a Postgres database. And Pete can correct me for everything I've gotten wrong here. Uh, but th those two things are kind of have a lot of energy right now, and I'm excited about them because everything that I wanted to do in my uh, bigger bigger goals page sort of fits nicely onto this. Uh, I also had a catch up with uh, Paul Roney this morning. Uh, because he and I are sort of reviving the Tools for Thinking podcast as HyperTalk, which all of this flows into nicely as well, because uh, the process of doing some of these things would make really nice series of podcast episodes to explain and to, you know, uh, to clarify and so forth. And the artifacts that we want to leave behind as a neo book or whatever it's called uh, would also make good HyperTalk kind of artifacts uh, and so forth. So that's like a third project that folds in uh, to this process as well. So maybe I'll ask Pete to amplify correct riff on any of that and then see what anybody else would like to ask or think or whatever. 
Um, you covered it really well, Jerry. I think I we could go into more details, but that's uh, the gist. Yeah. Awesome. I love it when I represent something reasonably. Uh, Flancian, Aram, any questions or thoughts? Uh, so I'm interested in following along. I uh, I guess um, on a meta level, I always go back to you know how to keep track of things and so on. In particular, because I'm particularly bad at that. I don't know if you know this, but I'm like. Uh, I'm sometimes very present and then I, I disappear and then come back and so on. So catching up and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, I wonder, like, I guess we, we, we mentioned in the past, like a few ways of keeping track of uh, shared projects and so on. Like, of course we have the actually the OGM, the massive wikis, and I guess we have on that level, the idea of like uh, aggregating all of these into um, the massive week or, or whatever else on, but also like, I guess like backtracking or like um, any kind of tracking um, uh, somewhere could be interesting, interesting, um, or a feed even. Um, uh, yeah, I guess it's just like meta. And yes, ChatGPT or like I guess fine tuning now. Uh, I saw uh, there's a, like a lot going on, of course, when like uh, for reducing the cost of fine tuning, like with things like LoRa, I guess, and like uh, you know also based on on, on open um, open models, more open models. Uh, ChatGPT is still, of course, the state of the art, it seems, but like open source is catching up quite quickly, thankfully. So I guess I wonder if, like, I, I, I still think that going like ChatGPT plus uh, your your reign is is going to be like really interesting. Uh, but I guess I, I I hope we can do that also like uh, the uh, completely open approach in parallel. I guess it's just like a wish, more than a concrete uh, idea. And, and about the HyperTalk is a new name of the podcast? Yes, we're renaming it HyperTalk in, in homage to the language from HyperCard, which only a few people know is a, is a thing. And for anybody else who doesn't know, it's like you know, hyper-connected conversations is a, good, is a good phrase, a good umbrella for a podcast. So, so that's the name of it. Um, Paul is uh, up to his nostrils in a round of fundraising. Uh, which is not easy right now. So he's been really absorbed in that. But we're trying to sort of work around that to figure out, hey, let's let's stand up some uh, some episodes. And the conceit of this of the Hyper Talk podcast is to invite people to host short sequences of calls, uh, and to so for us to basically produce other people hosting a bunch of calls, including ourselves, because I'm certainly interested in doing a bunch of them. But to have collections of people who say, hey. I have a plan for four episodes and that's it. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to do four episodes and here's who I want to invite and here's the topic and, and so forth. And we'd be like, awesome, do it. And then we want to sort of unify all that on probably a, a massive wiki, uh, uh, which, we're, which we're setting up for that purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to have some specs for, okay, good. This is, this is what it takes to have an episode that looks and smells like a, a hyper talk uh, a podcast, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, to leave behind uh, objects and, and documents and videos in the same sort of way, uh, and to make that all all kind of uh, happen. So I'm I'm working with him and whoever else feels like it to to stand that up. Go ahead, Aram. Yeah, I think that's cool. I think it sounds sort of uh, like a podcast zine. Yes, you can right? easily say that's that. sort of the the general con general contribution policy. Anyone can put in. Um, and then making sure you're recording sort of how to continually reproduce it. I think that's uh, that's pretty interesting. It's sort of a collection of zines in a sense under a podcast umbrella is, is kind of the intention here. Um, right, right. Sort of like a, well, sort of like a zine with different issues, right? Because yeah. you're, you're standardizing the format in some sense. Yep. Like a toolkit as well, maybe, yeah. Yep. Uh, Peter? Yep. Um, thanks. I, um, I, I guess, uh, and, well, I wanted to, to follow on to something Jerry said, and then maybe I'll do a check-in at some point. It doesn't have to be right away. But, um, but I wanted to say, uh, folding things into a podcast, this is almost a non sequitur, but maybe it's not, um, reminds me. <laughs> um, uh, in the U.S., there's uh, in the U.S. and the southeastern states, there's a big um, 
controversy about uh, drag queens um, um, and performers. And so I, I just read this morning that Madonna um, added a show, I think, or something like that, or, or um, added a stage to a show in Nashville or something like that where she's going to have drag queens perform. So they're not allowed to perform. And so she's uh, extending an, an, um, an, an arm and like, I'm going to protect you and give you space to be on my podcast uh, or or zine, be in my zine or whatever. Um, so I don't know, the, the imagery struck me. Um, so Jerry, you're almost like Madonna. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to start wearing like a, a bra of some kind yep, or, yep, doing, yep. or kissing priests or something. I don't know. I got to do something, something a little, yep. something a little controversial. Um, and, and Pete, it may amuse you that, uh, I nice. have my 2003 retreat t-shirt on. Yeah. And also this is the t-shirt that had on the back. A, yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. This is just a little, uh, mind map of how the retreat That's came lovely. about. <laughs> um, chick, chicken wise, since I've got the, the podium, I guess, um, Please. uh, along with the things that Jerry has mentioned, um, I've also been doing a fair bit of, um, talking about, uh, talking about chat GPT and LLMs in the context of, um, uh, different cultures, uh, and, and uh, cultural bias uh, that's built into something like ChatGPT, um, ways you can maybe get around it a little bit, um, uh, stuff like that. So that's been going on on the OGM list and, and I've been spending a fair amount of time doing, I think a pretty good job of, of kind of walking us through some of the, some, some thinking about, you know, how, what's, what's, a, what's a way to think about ChatGPT and, and also what are, how do, how would we think about some of its weaknesses, I guess. And I will add that on the various lists that Pete and I are both on, there's several of these conversations going and Pete is showing extreme patience, care and dedication to like present these things and like, Hey, here's what's happening. Here's what's going on. While other people are like, oh my God, look, it can't do this or it doesn't do that. Or, or you know, look, I, I read this piece that says it, 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 you know, and Pete's like, okay, everybody keep your pants on. And like, <laughs> here's kind of what's happening. And I, Pete, I really appreciate that because, because your depth of understanding of what's going on and then your capacity to explain and reframe and, and so forth is awesome. It's like really inspiring. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, w one of the experiments, by the way, uh, we got um, one of somebody said, well, there must be a Chinese version of uh, chat GPT. Um, and I don't know that there's one of those, but there is something called chat GLM. Um, and I found an unofficial uh, instance of it running. The, the official instance is waitlisted. Um, it was trained, as I understand, on a trillion Chinese tokens and a trillion English tokens. So it's 50-50 Chinese English. And we've had discussions about, you know, like um, uh, uh, Kevin Jones, um, bless his heart, <laughs> keeps saying, why is ChatGPT stuck in Western white male worldview? Um, and and the, the very short answer I have back for him is kind of, we're all stuck in Western white male <laughs> worldview. And, um, you know, and... You know, you can actually ask GPT to chat GPT to be something different or come from a different viewpoint or ask it for, I was asking it about um, what's what's equivalent to people doing philosophy um, in other cultures. Uh, turns out uh, philosophy was one of the philosopher was one of the, the things we've been rotating around. And just the, the, the term philosopher essentially means an old white guy from, you know, uh, Europe. Um, which, which wasn't obvious when we started the conversation. It's like, why, when you ask it for a list of philosophers, does it give you old white guys? And it's like, well, that's essentially what a philosopher means because, you know, philosophy is the name that we've given the short name that we've given to what is a longer, you know, thing of Western philosophy, which includes Western ideas of epistemology or epistemics or whatever, you know? Um, so philosophy is a condensed word that means Western white male. Um, even though that wasn't obvious to any of us at the outset. Um, so anyway, um, 
uh, anyway, I got into the business of, of uh, talking to chat GL GLM, the Chinese one, and just barely scratched the surface of uh, starting to ask it. In, instead of like list of set of philosophers, it actually gives you back Western philosophers because philosopher means Western. Um, you can keep going and expand from there, but um, but what I what I brought up was uh, asking a culturally interesting questions is probably a more useful thing. So if you've got a an LLM that's been trained with a different corpus, uh, a, a corpus that has a different cultural bias, um, the interesting to do it thing to do with it is ask it kind of human human level questions. Um, uh tell me about the love of a mother for her, her child uh what's better loyalty or bravery um you know uh, i just broke up with my I, I just got in a fight with my best friend um uh, how how can i make that situation better you know if you ask human relevant questions that don't have a cultural bias by the way that you ask them then you can start to explore the you know the cultural background of of an llm and so I started doing that just a tiny bit with the uh, with Chat GLM in English and Chinese, which was interesting. Um, you know, junior varsity version of some of what Pete has done over the weekend. I spent the weekend with a group of people who are experts in Christopher Alexander and pattern languages, and mm -hmm. also Ward Cunningham was in the group, so he, the inventor of the wiki. And Sunday morning, I was suddenly inspired to ask ChatGPT something that one of the participants had said. The day before while we were talking and he had said um you know I, I went to the i turned to a pattern language for guidance on how to design a roof deck and i found the advice in there just perfect it was not too not too little not too much so my prompt to chat gpt was you are christopher alexander author of a pattern language what advice would you give someone at home depot uh on how to build a roof deck and the answer was really good it was it was it, it didn't cite particular numbered patterns but the content of the of the answer was really excellent totally took into consideration that this was a roof and you should worry about materials and uses and all that and and, and, and everybody was like whoa crazy because because i was the youngest person in the group and everybody's not like completely up on what's going on here oops we lost pete um so, so it was it was fascinating, and I think that there's a there's a really interesting frontier here. Hey, you're back. Um, there's a really interesting frontier here where, if we can get used to these things and apply them well, we can sort of uh, plow right through a bunch of things that many of us thought as barriers. And and I think just waking up to what the barriers are in your head, which is happening to me now on a like daily basis, as uh, people like Pete and others sort of do experiments and share out what they're doing is is like really cool and fun work. Yeah, very cool. Uh, I, I also have my uh, so first I'm a, I'm really just about this connection between uh, other languages and like a, a GPT. I guess I did think it will know about that, but of course that's I guess part of the evolution here, right? As in like thinking of things. And you know, uh, I guess uh, areas to explore with like uh, language models. It reminds me a bit of when I was new to the internet. I, I don't know if you have this experience. I will remember like was uh, being in Alta Vista back then before, Google. Uh, and like thinking, oh, what what can I type here? You know, searching uh, you know for my favorite writers, for my favorite things, and then like just being in the box there and thinking, oh, what what else can I explore? And maybe not even just coming to terms with the fact that that was possible, right? And to some extent, I think uh, we, uh, we are going through the same process and like there's this joy and, uh, and this reinforcement loop uh, that is interesting because it will do better in some areas than others and discovering which ones it does better or worse is part of the excitement, no? And I went through this a bit uh, over the weekend as well with a friend who had been doing like a, a more like ChatGPT coding, enable coding. He was like, oh, you should really try it. I was like, I have read, I have seen examples. But then I finally tried it for like a, a coding task. And actually seeing in action was so uh, impressive in the sense that, you know, I gave it like a JSON dump, you know, just, I mean, with like uh, this JSON with this structure I made up, right? So probably never seen before. And I asked it to convert it to the right shape, essentially to graph it as a validity graph. And just using the uh, semantic identifiers, it, it even further structure. 
and wrote the transform, which, you know, it's like, you know, I don't know, half an hour of coding and, and, and troubleshooting and JavaScript for me more, and it did it in 20 seconds, right? Um, uh, and there it, 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 it was this wow moment, which is like, you know, like what, to some extent, like, one thing is to know and, and you know when you see the report, but I felt it when I, you know, when it hit close to some extent. I have, I'm realizing I have a thought in my brain called my aha moments with technology. Right. And one of them is being in a, a big auditorium at the, I think, Interstate Commerce Commission in downtown DC, yeah. where uh, uh, Steve Jobs and the original Macintosh crew were on stage to do la like a presentation tour about this new Macintosh thing. And Andy Hertzfeld went up and opened McDraw, uh, spray painted a little boulder uh, with the tools, right? Made a made a boulder, spray painted it a little bit of color, and then took the lasso, lassoed it, and moved it around the screen really quickly. And there was an audible gasp in the room, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone was like, <gasps> and you that that's what that's on my list. Another one is Switcher when Switcher first came out, and I was at the Washington Apple Pie, which was the little club that that we sort of joined. Uh, and somebody showed me, oh, you can run several apps, and then you can switch between them, and it looks like a little cube rotating. And it's like. <gasps> So I, I need to add one of these moments uh, for ChatGPT to that list because clearly that's I'm having it's a visceral experience once you sort of try it and see it and, and do it. It's really cool. A, a smaller way Jerry described it that 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 kind of feeling um, and when we were talking earlier this week was um, you I, we were you, talking about people. My, I, actually, one of the things I've said with ChatGPT um, is uh, a really useful way to use it is in conversation. People come to it and they think it's an oracle, um, so they ask it for facts, which is bad. But then the other thing that they do is they think it's a search engine, so they type something and it's like, okay, this is the definitive, you know, result. And it turns out what you want to do with ChatGPT is actually converse with, with it. You know, you want to ask it, oh, tell me more about this, or you know, I, I didn't think that, or whatever, right? You want to like it's a it's an interactive thing and that's the thing that it's really great at. Uh, we were Jerry and I were commiserating kind of that there are people who don't don't get it yet. And Jerry said it's kind of like riding a bike. You know, you can describe people how what it's like to ride a bike and they could go, Yeah, 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 I get it. You know, it's got wheels and it goes fast and it's it's a bike, I get it. But until you ride a bike, you haven't really experienced that, you know, that experience. It's it's qualitatively different than understanding you know what it might do it's just a different feeling yeah. so that's been helpful when I've, i i think about um, people jerry um as they you know as they say something you know it's like okay they then they haven't ridden the bike yet <laughs> yeah yeah i i think i see this more like uh, and it's interesting uh, so scott alexander you know um from uh slay star colleagues slay, slay, slay star colleagues you know as, as a psychiatrist I mean, he's a well known in the rational rationalist sphere he has had articles on GPT back to GPT-2, I guess. And I actually went back and read the GPT-2 one. And, you know, and he listed back then a lot of the uh, criticisms of GPT, which you can still see uh, argued against like GPT-4 even, as in like, oh, it's just a pattern matcher, or it's just spewing you know, like what, you know, what's already been written. And and I think of the, I get the same feeling right now, where it's like, I don't think this person has actually used it to some yeah. extent. Yeah. 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 Um, so I guess uh, we will see that uh, concerts shrink, or uh, interestingly, maybe uh, some people will just continue thinking that, um, uh, and you know, essentially become like uh, people who don't use it. Uh, I could see that. Uh, uh, let's yeah. see. It's going to be an interesting so uh, sociological observation. Um, uh, Siski? No, I don't. I think yes. I think that I think that's so, Slate Star Codex's name, but I'm not sure. Right yeah. adjacent to that, I, as I've been doing experiments, um, I I always feel a little bit guilty pasting in the ChatGPT results into email because it makes the emails really long, right? And at some point, we're all going to be fed up with everybody sharing. Kind of like you know, Dolly was super cool to share your your Dolly experiments for the first like four days, and then after that, it's like okay, I never want to see anybody else's Dolly ever again, you know, except for the people who are really good. But right, right, um, right. Uh, so I like to think I'm. I'm pretty good with ChatGPT, and I I give myself a little bit of leeway to still post things um, that I get back. Um, but I'm I, I started I've already started, you know I'm just gonna as, as, another thing that people don't get is how to ask it questions, and 
Um, I had a really interesting conversation with Jordan Sukud, actually, who's very good with ChatGPT. He's using it for a writing assistant and just going great guns with it. The the model that people have for ChatGPT, or most people don't have a model of ChatGPT. They don't really understand what's going on and how to use it and how to use it effectively. So they'll ask it just um, kind of rote questions that, that don't go anywhere, right? It's like, okay, well, I tried the ChatGPT thing. I typed in, you know, um what size shoes does michael jordan wear and it it was wrong and then i i decided to quit you know i i i, I tried the chat you think it sucks mm -hmm. you know and it's like yeah you, there's a there's a little bit of art still too and jerry and i have talked about this it's actually difficult to use chat gpt well it's you have to have a model of it you have to have a thought process of what you're trying to get out of it and what it's giving back to you and things like that. So anyway, I have started in my emails a, a couple times. I've just put the prompts. I haven't my, my questions, which are still not obvious to a lot of people, um, but just the, the questions. And it's like, if you want to know the answer, just go ask ChatGPT yourself, get the, the experience. But it reminds me, I, I remember really early in search engine days when you would post Google results for people because you know it was strange for them to try to formulate a search. They didn't understand how to talk to Google, right? So there was a, a short time where you would post not only you know um, the search, but you'd also post the results. And I I feel like that's what we're 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 at that point still with ChatGPT. It's still worth posting the results, even though you know hopefully in a, a month or six months um, everybody be a, a lot more savvy about it, and we don't. We don't do that. It's very interesting because now, like when you go when you do keyword search default these days on Google, you get back results that kind of anybody can get, but you know that your results might not be the same as mine because we know that the algorithm is trying to tune for, <clears throat> I think, with good intentions, what what might serve us best rather than someone else best. Yeah. Could be a complete could be that I'm totally wrong and that the algorithms are busy just trying to sell me more stuff all the time only. Um, but this conversational interaction of prompts and prompt engineering and prompt craft uh, is different. And so, and the answers are longer and wordier uh, and fewer. And so, so, so I don't know how that's going to play into whether we're going to keep sharing them or how we're going to, because, you know, you can kind of, I like the chat GPT kind of stores your different sets of, of, of query, uh, query conversations uh, along the way. That's pretty cool. Um, but I don't know how that's going to play out longer run. I guess it depends on whether how much of the prompt, because it's all of course prompted, like there's a hidden prompt and plus all the context and so on. And you know, like each, each message actually is getting the whole conversation as context, plus the prompt original. I, I guess it depends on whether the prompt, the, the hidden prompt remains uh, agnostic, which will make sense, I guess, I believe right now because of cost and complexity reasons, or whether there's like a, you know, Essentially, there starts to be uh, there starts being like a hidden prompt that is customized per user, and that will have the same effect as this uh, filter bubble, essentially. So it's a good question, and and Flancy, and you bringing it up that way that it sends the whole the whole conversation back and mm -hmm. forth reminds me that. Um, maybe folks here haven't heard I, I wrote actually. <laughs> ChatGPT4, uh, GPT4 and I uh, wrote um, a small Python script to interact with the API. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't happy with uh, whatever client I was. I don't know. Maybe it was actually just the. I, I guess I'm not happy with the web front end. It doesn't do a great job of, even though it does have a great list of conversations. I have way too many conversations to catalog, and now they're not on my computer. They're in the cloud and stuff like that. So I. I had I, I prompted Chat, uh, GPT four to write a little Python program that does it better. I think it 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 has a it it saves the um, the prompt the prompt and the input are in files basically, um, and I need to continue to improve it. But um, it was actually a really good experience using GPT four to write code. Um, it took me about two hours, uh, which I think was about the same amount of time it would have taken me anyway. But um, but I learned a lot. I, I now I know how to be faster uh, using uh, a coding bot. Um, and the other thing was, I I was sure at some point, you know, every every fifteen minutes within the two hours, I'm like, okay, well, it's gone far enough. I'm going to have to like take a take over now and finish this thing. But I 
kept saying, Pete, just try it. <laughs> you know, so I would say, ah, it looks like I got this error, you know, and Chad, uh, GPT would say, oh, okay, let me fix the whatever. And we got through it. We actually, uh, you know, went from a small idea to finished code and I let it do the whole thing and it, it did the whole thing. It wrote all the code, um, worked really well. Um, so I, I was happy with that. And it seems um, to work to feed the error messages back in as prompts. Oh yeah, it, it's great at that. It's it's actually it's Copilot is really good at that too. Um, so so anyway, it's called Sylph. Um, uh, let me know if you're interested in it. Uh, right after I I posted on a short announcement of here's Sylph, you know my first try. Um, one of my friends was like, Pete, have you heard of Chap? <laughs> So Chap is actually a pretty nice uh, terminal UI um, uh, chat client, chatbot client, um, uh, and it's worth looking at. Actually, it, it's um, it uses a cool library, and it can talk to. It's built so that it can talk to a couple different backends, not just ChatGPT. Yeah, well, we have to take a look. Yes, I already know this. Uh, there's also LangChain, which I became aware of recently. As and it seems like a I think I haven't played with it, but it seems like a nice LLM agnostic uh, like framework to build on. Just not to like, uh, you know, become too um, entangled with the open AI. Yep. Yeah, I've, I've seen people do good stuff with LangChain. Um, Pete, yeah. I didn't keep the link to chat when it went by. I should have curated it in my brain, but do you still have it? Uh, which one? Chat. Oh, uh, I'll, I can put it in. Thanks. Yeah, after I put the self link in, which self is actually the. <laughs> everyone should read. So somebody's saying everyone should read a post. I I, I will take that. Dark Lang. <laughs> Dark Lang is a fun idea. Good developers, and uh, I think their assessment of how to plan to work in a different environment is spot on. And so I think basically every language should do this. They're in a particularly good position to do it, but you know, operating systems and other systems should also do this. And they're a team that collectively was able to say, OK, uh, sure, we'll, we, we'll commit to this. And so we're going to write all of our own code this way too. And we'll be writing code that uh, allows other people to do the same. And we'll make sure that the interfaces we're making for our own language or meta language are um, are good for models that are writing code and not just good for people that mm. are writing code. Interesting. We'll read it. Thank you. It's very interesting. I'm, I'm feeling a sense of acceleration uh, ever since sort of uh, the, the image generators kind of started and then like, like to this point here, this, the thing, it feels like we're sort of in a the, one of those, um, maybe it's one of those uh, fairground rides where you stand in a cylinder and the cylinder starts spinning and they drop the floor out or something, whatever you call those. But it feels a little bit like that. Um, I've never been in that, but now I really want to. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you've never been. <laughs> and and that's, that's, a, that's, that's a cousin ride of the disc uh, where people stand on the floor and they start spinning and you try to stand uh, without getting sent to the walls, kind of thing. And then there's a German oh. there's a German game show where they have women sit in a carousel and then they spin it faster until the last woman sitting in the middle wins. It's very strange. Germans have strange. Uh, Gravitron. Yeah, Gravitron. Is that what the, the yeah. ride is called? Yeah. It was uh, one of my kids. It was their favorite ride. Cool. Are you right? Gravitron ride. Ooh. 24 RPM. <laughs> it feels a lot more like that's its, that's its fast, fastest speed. Yeah. Oh. Ah, three Gs. It feels like three Gs. So I guess I wonder, like, you know, the topic of like, I guess the commons and, you know, decentralization and so on. I guess I think of like how to enable, I mean, I don't, I'm currently not in the space to be able to do something like I guess uh, Darlang or, uh, you know, or contribute to Langchain or so on. But I wonder if there's an opportunity to actually contribute to like making it more likely that, uh, that a decentralized approach and a commons friendly approach like wins out or like at least doesn't fall behind 
uh, OpenAI and Microsoft just like going all for it. Um, did you all so, see the did you all see the open letter to uh, desist on accelerating research on this that a bunch yeah. of people signed? I, nah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not. We've already had this discussion. I'm not the biggest fan of what ChatGPT is doing or how they're presenting it. Yeah. But also, I think a group of people that includes dudes who are like. Yeah, it's totally worthwhile to burn the Earth off if we get to Mars. Right, are not people whose advice I'm interested in in this context. That is a bit of a problem. Yeah, yeah. So I actually haven't read the letter yet, but I know of it. Uh, I guess I was saving it up. Uh, yeah, I really like the open letter approach in general. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan of open letters. And trying to actually uh, like draw a few, but it's all about the letter, of course. I I saw the the thing that I thought, without even making it conscious in my head. I somebody said it on on uh, on Mastodon. Um, I'll have to find it. Uh, One of my favorites. But I, the the open letter, like pausing pausing. Uh, if you have a fast accelerating technology calling for pausing it is actually not a good idea. Um, so it was Leonard LHL. You probably know LHL, SJ. Okay. Random foo. Um, yeah. uh, I think he's a, a Wikipedia person. Probably I, that's that covers a lot of ground. Uh, LHL, uh, open foo. Uh, Leonard? Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, he's like, yeah, AI yeah, is scary. I get it. But <laughs> from a game theoretic and practical reality um, thing, it's, you know, goofiest and, and goofy and wishful thinking. Um, yeah, I think Judge well, said uh, the confetti has left uh, the canon. <laughs> <laughs> so so when when some group says let's pause development of this like exciting stuff the good guys will pause but the bad guys aren't going to pause and so you just tilt the the balance right it just gets worse it doesn't get better the confetti has left the can unfortunately like in arms race situations like this you've got to worry about that balance yes um i'm reminded of uh, chris peterson and the foresight institute way back in the day when they saw nanotech coming and uh she and um Drexler uh were worried about it and then started Foresight uh, Institute. They did a really bang up job of keeping ahead of the of the um of the event horizon. Uh so really early they had set up uh getting everybody in a room and talking about the the possible dangers of down attack and having folks sign up for pledges of, you know, safe, safe exploration and things like that. And one of the really cool things that they did, um, uh, Chris was really good at getting really disparate parties around the same table. So there were the, the life extension people and there were, you know, um, upload your brain people. And there was, you know, the CIA, NSA kinds of people. So a bunch of different people who were interested in nanotech, um, who were on really different sides of of reality <laughs> um she was still able to get them all in a room uh talking together and and getting it done so the the apparently the nanotech wavefront kind of diffused um before it got too scary although it would be interesting in hindsight to think about whether or not that was because foresight jumped in so early um, to try to get ahead of the wavefront Go ahead, Sam. Oops. I, I thought you were going to jump in a moment ago. No. I, I, I like foresight. I was just thinking, I was just, um, I appreciate naming the, the skill of getting disparate people together around a table. This feels different, though. And I think that's that's one of the, that's one of the challenges with open letters appeals to organizations or something like this. That's probably one of many things that need to happen, but really there are, there are a lot. It actually needs 
uh, everyone needs to sort of move one step up in abstraction, we should be rethinking um, equilibria. It's not like things like a technology that's going to get implemented and may and may do unexpected, may have externalities for the current equilibrium is pretty different. And despite uh, sci-fi readers really believing in nanobots that build buildings for you, that's not how anything other than biology works. That's why biology is so cool. And these guys are not biologists. So energetics is hard. Uh, we exist because energetics is hard and we are the embodiments of what it can be like. But uh, this does feel, this feels uh, different in a, in a constructive way. And the people who are worried about regulation are not actually building new positive futures. So that's not helpful. So we have to identify new positive equilibria, probably a bunch of them, many more than people are used to. And uh, maybe, you know, even fragment and have a bunch of groups that, that move towards the different equilibria and not have arguments about which is the right one because none of them, they're all the wrong one. That's fine. Uh, maybe we end up, um, you know, maybe, maybe we end up with a, with a number of isolated sub biomes. That's fine. That's actually healthy. Um, having an argument about which non-differentiated biome we want to sort of uh, use all the resources out of and then collapse is not is not interesting. So no, uh, and and all of these questions about like, oh, we should we should accept that the big players are the ones who are going to decide our future. And so we should slow them down. Just all all options are bad. It's like negative inverse strategy. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It's uh, I like, I like the idea of working with the stability network. I like um, Emostack's approach to why small models are useful. I think we should all imagine a world where everyone has local, they have, you know, they own their own hardware and models and are doing things with them like their own tools, separate from whatever big orgs are doing. And we should we should like work on that independent of, like, I think of all the big orgs now as they're, you know, it's like having munitions factories. We have a lot of munitions factories. Uh, and that's okay. Maybe it's not okay, but that's a different question. That's like, maybe we should all stop. That's, that feels like a question for people who want to, that, that's a good governance question. That's like, um, large global coordinated efforts to maintain peace of some kind. Well, and after Oklahoma city bombing, they had to watch shipments of, uh, uh ammonium nitrate because you can use a truckload of that to make a bomb that'll take it on a building. And it's like, mm, there's a lot of explosive stuff. I remember when I was little, I had a re an actual real chemistry set. Yes. And if you get one of those today, there is nothing in there you can harm yourself with. Which sort of sucks. <laughs> <clears throat> they got and shitified. Um, yeah. Uh, SJ, all that was well said. Um, and I like the, especially like the idea of different positive equilibrium a question um because i don't i don't know enough about it how it works the bunch of articles about how stanford using alpaca and yama and all that kind of stuff have now replicated chat gpt for 600 bucks on the desktop uh, my understanding is that part of the expense of doing any of these models is the training which eats like enormous resources and and cpus and there my question is does the Stanford, does the Stan, does the Alpaca, et cetera, et cetera, include a well-trained model that actually can make all the decisions, or does it just include the basics with which you would then need to like run a, a corpus through the engine? I think it's just fine-tuning on top of Meta's Llama. So yeah. Llama is still the the millions of dollars of training. Um, and... So it's already trained up. It's just that you're sort of adding stuff to it or able yeah. to manipulate well, it. Yeah, you, you're not adding knowledge to it. You're actually tuning it so that it, you know, Mark Antoine said something interesting on FJB um, Monday. Um, he said that he's heard, and so this is second hand or third hand at this point, but but anyway, he, he's heard somebody liken fine tuning to more like lobotomization than adding um, knowledge. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's training the, the big model to filter itself better to give what you want but it's not adding basic knowledge under the hood. And I think there's going to be a lot of lobectomies coming as people try to impose some kind of limits on these models. And then these are not all going to be good experiments. 
I, th I would say a better way to think about it, um, which has only become clear in the last year, is that these, these centrally trained models are surprisingly good universal models that can then be fine-tuned. And this is part of the magic that it will take an entire field to understand. So you can take one of those models. It does take a lot of time to train it once, but the connections that are that are built up are now very capable at being uh, at being mapped onto other things. And I, it's often not a lobotomy. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of fine tuning to add um, to add connections or to add uh, to add capabilities. I'm going to share with you a draft paper that I worked on that we just submitted to a computer vision conference, basically taking an early version of GPT uh, and taking, taking pre-trained GPT and a pre-trained image encoder, and then just training a linear projection from the output of the, of the image encoder to the input of GPT. So instead of giving GPT a string of words, those words already get mapped into some input space, just mapping this image feature encoding into the same input space and then training it on you know, a fairly small corpus of captions. And that was a really cheap process. And now you have uh, a captioning tool for images. And I think those kinds of things are very, like, basically every approach people have taken to doing stuff like that seems to work. So very cheap, much cheap. I mean, it, it, a, it was reasonably cheap to do Llama, but this kind of stuff is a hundred times cheaper. And, th and this is without anyone trying to optimize the compute for any of these things. It's just, oh, what if we try a small, what if we try a simpler task and we still take the greedy algorithm approach to implementing the task? Um, I, I would worry less about that. I would worry more about uh, the fact that having a having a super capable general model could just have side effects we don't have a handle on. We're not prepared for it, yeah. Right. Um, another dumb question. Norvig wrote what I think is a reasonably famous paper back in 2009, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data, where he was talking about how really large amounts of data changed the nature of what you can solve and how good your algorithms get. Um, is that what's playing out here in part with uh, the training sets we have and the ability of these models to hold uh, representations of that scale of data? Or is that a different thread of thinking? This is not an important question to answer, but I'm like, I'm, I'm just making it's a, it's a good question. I, I think, I mean, this, of course, creates transformer and so on, which is 17. And I, I think, I guess, attention is the, the, the big tool, but apart from like, just like, you know, uh, uh, 2009, like deep learning hadn't like, uh, like, uh, came, come to fruition yet, I guess, for most things. But I, I guess, you know, yes, uh, to train deep models, you do need a lot of data. And I think, uh, you know, the limits of that. Uh, uh, it's sort of like what this paper, I think, explores, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it, I think it, uh, there's at least some interesting parallels there, just from like essentially training uh, these models with like whole of the whole of the internet or whatever it is. Uh, this uh, uh, this corpus is uh, this corpora that they that they are being trained on, um, and then. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, but I don't know. Like maybe uh, the the transformer essentially approach uh, is like what is actually. I, I don't I don't think the, uh, so. We have more compute, so there definitely uh, more data goes into the training of these models. But I think tra uh, the transformer architecture is the big the big differentiator uh, that we are seeing like uh, code to fusion now. Mm -hmm. It yeah, they they enable each other though, kind of mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, because you need a lot of data to, uh, to train the models, right? I so a a complementary way to to say it, Jerry. And I, I this is something that I see actually Ken right now um, on the list is um, the the discussion that Ken and I are having on the list. Uh, it's really really hard, and to to Nervik's point, even back then, right? It's really 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 hard for humans to understand um, scale 
Um, so the difference between a million and a billion sounds like I just changed a letter, you know, it's a pretty much the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, eh. mm -hmm. <laughs> and the difference between a, a billion and a trillion or a million and a trillion, you know, it's like, well, it's just a lot of zeros. It's pretty much the same thing, right? And actually, no, a, a million is a very much different thing than a trillion. And, yep. you know, and ChatGPT is in trillions now. And it's, you know, substantially different just because of the scale. Thanks. And it's hard to imagine, like humans just don't, you know, it's like, like, like there's no way that you can, you know, um, I, I put a link to the dark side of LLMs. I think it's, it's a little bit over dramatic, um, uh, but the, the author describes um, indirect prompt injection, which I hadn't thought of before, but now I do. <laughs> um so it's it's with bing um and it has to be an edge i think but his point is that you can uh B bing ai has input filters and output filters around it to protect it from stuff that you might tell it or to protect you from stuff it might say if you got through the output the input filters um so he's like well so the generalized problem here is that you can have you can attack it in a bunch of different ways um the the model is smart enough that it's going to be able to help you crack it <laughs> help you jailbreak it um so he his, this example is all you have to do is base 64 the the um, nasty input and it goes through the filter and then um wakes up chat gpt once or sorry not chat GPT, bing once and then once bing a ai is awake it's sitting there in the browser so when you browse over to your bank you know, it's still alive. Oh, good and Lord. Somebody could have injected bad stuff <clears throat> into the way it handles the stuff on the web page. So, oh, good Lord. Um, the, the jailbreaks that he's got in here, I, this is a week old or so, and I, I think they're they're filled by now. But the general, so, so now we have to train people. Don't just copy in, in the way that we used to train people about the, sh you know, command shell or, or DOS or whatever. Don't just copy and paste something that you see right. on the web into your prompt. <laughs> Without understanding, you know, if if you don't understand it in English, and it's got funny symbols in it, ask somebody else before you hit return. You know, don't do that. This sounds non-trivial and easier easier to fall for than somebody telemarketing your grandpa for insurance he doesn't need. And he or... makes the point that uh, you know, once once you've got being once the um, bad guy has got Bing under its control. It's really easy to ask Bing to uh, social engineer the user, you know, yeah. because. <laughs> and, and, the, the, I, and the direction I thought you were going and that you weren't was how easy it is to jump the guardrails that they're trying to put around some of these engines. Like, why can't I say, hey, you are a science fiction author. Uh, give me six ways that I could like destroy the earth. You know, yeah, uh, that's I, the, yeah. Give, give me the heart. You are a hard science fiction author, which means it's based on actual science and facts or whatever. Give me six ways yeah. to destroy the earth. And how are you going to prevent chatty chat GPT from saying, oh, oh, I got that. I got that. Mm -hmm. First, first you could. Yeah. <clears throat> you have another instance of chat GPT. Read the first instances. And it's like, ah, eh, looks like they're trying to blow up the world. Yeah. And and you're going to prevent ChatGPT from writing science fiction? Like, where's that boundary, right? Yeah. I mean, I think when talking about like regulations here, I think part of the issue is less about the development of the software or the questions of the output. Though I think the obviously the limitations need to be put in place for the output, but like more about the questions of the input um, and how these systems interact with their input. I think one of the more accurate things of that a lot of people, a lot of people have come to, not a lot of people, that some very smart people have come to in their analysis is that most of the objections about chat GPT are really objections to capitalism. Um, in the sense that like nobody cares if all their art gets scraped if it, they're not dependent on their art to make money. Um, so seeing that we're probably not going to flip the switch to turn off capitalism. I do think that there is some, I mean, I would like to, 
I just don't think it's going to happen right now. I'm really uh, interested in whether there's anything at all that could cause something that dramatic to happen. And I would love to f play with that. That's a tangent, I mean, but, but I love the idea. Yeah. Um, but seeing as that's unlikely to happen in the near future, I do think we're to, to the question of how these things should be regulated, if they should be regulated, I do think they should be regulated. And the regulations should deal with significantly focused on how they get their inputs and how people who author things, uh, be it art, text, or whatever, can choose to allow those inputs to be used for these specific purposes. Like this is a big, so putting, us, putting aside the training chat GPT problem, the problem of websites being scraped for one purpose and used for another purpose is like real bad in the publishing space.